Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and I know for some a very late evening. I'm Max Hegwell, Meditator in Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on microbial ecotoxicology. FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, invests in science, using the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community. So we provide grants to scientists, organize and support conferences, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series, which provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the current cancellation of in-person events and conferences. Each month, we are highlighting a different topic of microbial ecology, so if you missed Earlier webinars, they are also available via the FEMS and OUP websites. Before we begin, I also wish to thank the staff of FEMS and Oxford University Press for all their work in making these webinars happen and the behind the scenes uh, detail that's so important. Today, we focus on the topic of microbial ecotoxicology. Our speakers will highlight some of the fascinating questions and the interdisciplinary investigations of the response of the microbial compartment in ecosystems subject to environmental contamination. We have an introduction to key questions in this emerging area of microbiology ecology research by Stéphane Delemeur, followed by presentations by Wei Min Sun, Dimitrios Karpozas, and Karen Voigts, who will explore microbial adaptation in antimony contaminated soils the response of soil philosphere microbial communities to repeated fungicide application, and then how green infrastructure and atmospheric pollution shapes urban bacterial communities. After the uh, four talks, we will open the session for your questions and for discussion on this. So please submit your questions via the question link. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stefan, Wayman, Dimitrios, and Karen. And uh, first, uh, Stefan, I'll give the floor to you and uh, you can take the lead on introducing us, us to this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? And can you see my screen? Yes, we're good. Okay, great. So uh, let me start by um, stating that uh, microbial ecotoxicology is not uh, a discipline like uh, microbial ecology, but uh, it's a research area which is very interdisciplinary. It associates microbial ecology, uh, chemistry, toxicology. And uh, the idea is uh, here to uh, understand uh, uh, interactions of microbes uh, with pollutants and uh, with each other in communities, looking at the molecular level, the organism level, the community level, and the ecosystem level. And I guess the uh, main point here is that we also have a, a goal, which is to uh, put microbial contributions to ecosystem services on the map uh, for the general public, but also for policymakers. And uh, so my job is to give you key questions, but I guess we first need to also define the key challenges. And uh, one of the main challenges is just human activities. And human activities affect many things, but they also affect microorganisms. And I would like to point you to uh, this, uh, this uh, review by Kavikili et al. Um, and uh, it's about climate, but not just about climate. As you see, these human activities will have a lot to do with toxicity as well, uh, either pollutants or, or, or fertilizers and so on. And so, I won't, I won't uh, set too many questions. I guess I just want to propose a very generic one, uh, which would be how do microbial communities respond and adapt to toxic perturbations? I guess this applies to all the three talks today, 
and it is quite generic. Um, the key point here is these are questions of microbial response and adaptation. And um, of course, now we have lots of omics which make possible studies in unprecedented detail. But uh, when we look at the environment, uh, these responses will depend on pollutant availability, on the capacity of the microbial community to transform them. Uh, these responses will be affected and maybe also masked by variations in conditions, you know, including temperature, hydrodynamic regime, uh, toxicants which are present, there are mixtures, cocktails, concentrations, and so on. And also because biologically speaking, there are many different modes of response and adaptation to toxic perturbation. And if you look at uh, the classical ones like resistance, tolerance, and persistence, I want to point to this review here of 2006, which was uh, which explains these things very clearly uh, with, in relation to antibiotics. There is another one which I uh, think is very important with regard to ecosystem services, and this is resilience. And resilience, uh, of course, is something uh, which has to do uh, uh, with uh, the maintenance or gaining again a function within an ecosystem. And so, because of all these complexities uh, in conditions and modes of adaptation, uh, the question is how we can uh, disentangle at least apart all the different factors when we look at uh, microbial ecology. One way to, to, to tease uh, apart uh, different factors is to try to control environmental fluctuations, maybe doing lab work with mesocosms. And here I just want to show something that we do in Strasbourg. This is a, a, this is a 2D lab river uh, where we feed in uh, polluted water and we look at uh, fruit space and time, the evolution of microbial communities as a function of uh, bacterial degradation of halogenated pollutants. And this was set up uh, by, again, Eileen Feld and we have in Strasbourg, uh, CNRS, and we have a good uh, collaboration ongoing for many years now. Of course, we can stay in the lab uh, and do uh, try to look at the active players to try and make simpler communities. I think another thing that we need to do more is maybe look at the interactions from the molecular from molecules that, that are uh, used for interactions between different microbes. But uh, we also have, as I stated uh, earlier, key urgent uh, goals. Uh, which are operational in nature. We want to put microbes on the map also in the positive sense, especially uh, today when we are in a pandemic and we need to state again and again that microbes actually contribute positively to ecosystem services. And we need to convince policymakers that microbes can help uh, to uh, develop policies, develop a generalized uh, predictive models for risk assessment and we, we would like to be able to, to include microbes uh, to define uh, quality standards. At the moment uh, this is not the case and uh, of course also we can use microbes as indicators of uh, toxicity and uh, maybe they can be very useful to predict uh, more accurate uh, no effect concentrations and if you are interested in these questions, I guess the paper by uh, Stefan Pes uh, will be of interest to you. Um, so we need to make microbes visible, but uh, we also want to uh, make the scientists doing the science visible. And here I have to put in a, a plug for a network which exists, Ecotoxicomic, and there have been already uh, two uh, congresses. This is the first in Lyon in 2017 and there was one uh, we have no picture in 2020 because it was online. Uh, this is a community of scientists uh, and it's quite international even if it was started in France, uh, more than 180 members by now from 35 countries. And um, uh, so you can go to the website and register and it's completely free. And then you'll get all the information also for the next uh, ecotoxicology, microbial ecotoxicology conference, which will 
will be uh, in 2022 in Montpellier. And so I guess this also helps to put microbial ecotoxicology on the map. As you can see, uh, uh, publications which use exactly this term are increasing, uh, and they are also increasingly cited. So getting back to uh, today's uh, key questions, I guess uh, there are several questions which are maybe more precise uh, than the more generic ones that I got. Uh, mentioned before, Waymin is going to talk about antimony, and uh, I guess uh, his one question what one could ask uh, from his paper, which like the other two speakers, uh, their papers were published in the two last years in uh, microbial biology ecology. So how does the mining contamination affect soil microbial communities? Uh, and metabolic potential, this is really interesting. It's not just about taxonomy as a function of soil depth. And so there are issues of nutrient content and biomass and the type of, uh, and the extent of contamination as a function of uh, vertical profiles in soil. Uh, the second speaker of today, uh, Dimitrios, uh, was actually a speaker also at the Ecotoxicomic Congresses. Um, and uh, he is interested in pesticides or fungicides in particular and uh, in this case, iprodione, and he will uh, uh, talk about uh, comparisons between soil and philosphere and about negative and sometimes positive effects of pesticides and how they may differ in soil, which is well studied, and philosphere, which is well, less well known. And so here we're, we will hear about key microbial players and I guess the impacts of pesticides on uh, ecosystems third and last but not least speaker of today will be Karen Briggs and she will talk about the importance of a certain uh, abiotic and uh, biotic parameters uh, on um, the microbial communities in an urban environment and here this interplay uh, is clearly shaping microbial diversity and sometimes in unexpected ways. And I guess this will be also quite interesting to everyone today. So I guess we're in for a couple of, or a couple of three, uh, very interesting and diverse talks today. And with that, uh, I hand back to Max. Thank you, Stefan. A very nice introduction to the questions that we have in store for, for today. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Wei Min Sun from the Guangdong Institute of Eco-Environmental Science and Technology in Guangzhou. And again, as was already introduced, is going to talk about microbial adaptations to anti-contamination. So Wei Min, welcome. Thank you, Max. And thank you, Stefan, for introducing my, my uh, presentation. So I'm Wei Min Sang from Institute of Eco Environments and Soil Sciences. So today I'm going to talk about the story regarding the microbial adaptation in antimony contaminated soils. At first, I would like to introduce some research background about antimony. So antimony is a naturally occurring toxic metalloid. So the antimony and arsenic belonging to the group, belonging to the same group in the periodic table. So if you take a look at the periodic table, they both of them belong to the group 15 and they are neighbors in the, in the, in the periodic table. China accounts, for the, China accounts for more than 90% of the world's antimony production. So China is also the world's largest antimony producing country. The antimony toxicity are strongly dependent on their redox species. So we know that arsenic can be biotransformed by microorganisms. The microorganisms can transform arsenic by reducing oxy, uh, by reduction, oxidation, and demethylation and, and methylation. However, our knowledge regarding the antimony biotransformation is still very limited. It's not very clear how the microbial populations develop in response to long-term antimony pollution and which geo geochemical factors affect the microbial composition in antimony contaminated environments. 
So we have performed some previous studies and we found some very interesting uh, observations. For example, we found antimony related parameters show substantial effects on the, let me show, let me put this laser point. Yeah, antimony related parameters show substantial effects on the microfield diversity and the community. Here is a, is a result from a random forest model. The RF models it predicted that some antimony fractions, these are antimony fractions, show substantial effects on the, on the microbial diversity. This is a structural equation models. We found that some antimony concentrations show substantial effect on the microbial diversity and also the microbial abundance. So we also observed that the metabolic potentials of some innate microbial community was influ influenced by the antimony fractions. So here's a heat map showing the correlations between some antimony and arsenic contaminant fractions with the and the, uh, arsenic related genes. You can see here SB5 and SB3 showed significant and positive correlation with many of the arsenic related genes. This is the result from another uh, experiment uh, from another project. So we found this is a metagenome from antimony tailings. And this is maybe too small to see, but I can show you this is the arsenic related genes. And we found the presence of a lot of antimony, arsenic related genes in the antimony tailings. So now here we come to the first scientific questions. The how antimony contamination shapes the microbial community? In order to answer this scientific question, we, we perform, we investigate the effects of antimony on vertical soil profiles. We selected three vertical soil profiles from the world's largest antimony mining area. So that is the Shan mining area. So we selected, we selected uh, three soil profiles. Two of them are heavily contaminated and one is uncontaminated. So we characterize the microbial, the death resolve soil microbial community and investigate the microbial community of the mining contamination, or, or investigate the effect of the mining contamination or the microbial adaptation. So we can see the, from the geochemical profiles, we can see that contaminated soil profiles show the distinct death resolve effects when compared to the uncontaminated soil profiles. So this, if you can take a look at the box plot, you can see that the fractions of antimony are significantly higher in the contaminated soil profiles. The microbial community are also totally different. And you can see this cluster is from the, uh, the gray dots representing the microbial community from the uncontaminated soil profiles. The red and orange one represent the, the community from the contaminated soil profiles. If we take a deeper look at the data, we can, see, we can see that as soil death increased, the concentration of antimony gradually declined, uh, declined with the, incre with the increase of the, uh, sorry, I cannot see this, this one, declined with the contaminated soil profiles. So you can see this, this the, the, the yellow dot represents the, con the concentration of the different antimony fractions in the contaminated soil profiles, you can see the, decrease, the decreasing trend in the contaminated site. So we also observed that antimony contamination reduced the alpha diversity of the microbial com uh, community in each, uh, in, each soil prof in each profiles. And if you can compare this the alpha diversity index from the contaminated soil profiles and uncontaminated soil profiles. You can see the uncontaminated, the alpha diversity from the uncontaminated soil profiles are significantly higher than the guys in the contaminated soil profiles. The RF model also suggested that the low alpha diversity could be attributed to the contents of the total concentration of antimony. So we performed the RF model on the channel index and we can, we can see that the SBTOT is the most important factors affecting the uh, channel index. So we then perform the microbial interaction networks at different death profiles to see how microbial communities 
changed along the soil depth. And we see that microbial interaction in the UCP, so that is the pristine site, remained this the blue networks. The blue networks remained relatively stable, while it showed an obvious changing patterns in the in the in the yellow one you can see. The microbial the microbial interactions well loosely connected in the heavily contaminated surface soil, loosely, but gradually recovered and well and were well connected in the less contaminated deeper soil. So the network suggests that individual species become more connected with other partners to perform some, maybe some syntrophic functions in less contaminated soil deaths. So in order to verify this hypothesis, we perform the metagenomic to see the metabolic potential of the microbial communities in different soil depth. Because I don't have enough time to show you the other data, I just show you the data of the arsenic-related genes. So we found the abundance of arsenic-resistant genes decreased with the soil depth. So, so this is the, what we got, what we learned from the project re, uh, investigating the effect of animal con contamination on the different soil depths. So here we come to our second scientific question. So who can transform antimony? So this figure shows how we how we use the combination of DNA seed and the metagenomic binning to identify arsenide oxidizing bacteria. So in this project, we also use this platform to identify the bacteria responsible for antimony biotransformation. So we investigated, we identified, we tried to identify the bacteria responsible for anaerobic antimonide oxidation in paddy soils. So the rice, the rice tends to absorb more antimony than other cereal or other plants. So among the rice, the SB3, the rice are more efficient in uh, of uptake of SB3 than SB5. So if we can oxi oxidize the antimonide, that is SB3, to antimonide, that is SB5, if we can oxidize SB3 to SB5, then we can reduce the absorption of, of antimony by rice paddies. So we check, we want to investigate the occurrence of the antimony oxidation in paddy soils. So however, the paddy soil is a reduced environment which means the oxygen is absent in the rice paddies, especially in the flooded rice paddies. So the microorganisms can, may use nitrate as an alternative electron acceptor to oxidize antimonide. So we will try to investigate the occurrence of anaerobic antimonide oxidation in paddy soils. So we set up four different treatments of microcosm to, to investigate the such occurrence. So the red treatment represent SB3 plus nitrate. The blue one, SB3, and the, the orange one, nitrate only, and the gray one is a stereo control. So oxidation of antimonide to antimonate was only observed in the treatment amended with both antimonide and nitrate. If you can take a look at this figure, you can see the decrease of the antimonate, antimonide, SB3, and with the increase of antimonate over the course of incubation. However, you cannot see this trend in the, in the blue or gray uh, treatment. The blue one is the, we provided SB3 only, and this is a stereo control. We can also see a decrease of nitrate with an increase of nitrite in, in the red treatment. So this observation told us that Anaerobic, anaerobic antimony oxidation is driven by microorganisms and the amendment or the addition of nitrate may facilitate the anaerobic antimony oxi antimonide oxidation. So our next step is to identify the biomarkers responsible for this uh, process. So given the chemical, the similar chemical structure between arsenic and antimony, so we propose that microorganisms may use similar pathway to transform antimony as arsenic. 
So we selected the AIOA genes. This is a gene for anti-arsenide oxidation. So we propose that the AIOA genes may be responsible for antimonide oxidation. So we also set up three uh, different treatments, and we found the copies of the AIOA genes significantly, significantly increase throughout the incubation in the treatment amended with antimonide and nitrate. However, if you take a look at the blue or orange bar, this is the SP3 only or nitrate only, you can see that no such change in AIOA genes abundance. The AIOA genes abundance actually decreased a little bit in this case. Also, we, we, we found a significant and positive correlation between the abundance of AIOA genes in the treatment amended with the SP3 and the nitrate and the concentration of the SP5. So in another case, in another study, we performed the RNA, RT-PCR, and also we observed the transcribed AIOA genes showing a positive correlation with the concentration of SP5s. So all this evidence indicated that AIOA genes may be responsible for the antimonide oxidation. So now we have the we know microorganisms driven this process, and we have the biomarkers, so we can perform the DNA seq to identify the antimonide oxidizing bacteria. So we perform, we set up four different uh, treatments. So this is C13 or C12 CSBN and C13 C12 CN. So in this case, we provided C13 or C12 labeled biocarbonate plus SP5, SP3 plus nitrate. In the control uh, treatment, we only provide a C13 or C12 a biocarbonate plus nitrate. So if you take a look at this figure, you can, so we can see compared to the C12, C12 SBN. So this is the the black, the black, the black uh, lines. The highest abundance of the AIOA genes gradually shifts to the heavier fraction. If you can take a look here. It gradually shifts to the heavy fraction. It's, it is more obvious in the later date, in the later time point. So, so this implying that nitrate-dependent SBOB incorporated the C13 carbons over the course of the incubation. However, if you take a look at the controls, we didn't provide antimonide. So there is no shift during the whole course of the incubation. So then we selected, I label it here, I, we selected the representative fractions for amplicon sequencing. We characterized the microbial community of the representative fractions, and which I, I can show you the microbial community compositions in each, uh, in each fractions. So the bacterial enriched in this case, in the C13 SBN are of great interest because this bacteria might be responsible for the SB3 oxidation, antimonide oxidation. So finally, we I highlighted here, we found bacterial, that bacterial affiliated with azoacus, dominated in the heavy DNA fractions of C13 SBN, followed by the azospirial and gelativorans. Let me go back to a previous slide. So we selected this guy, the highest peak of the AIOA genes in the C13, SBN uh, treatment, we select this uh, heavy fraction for metagenomic, and we perform metagenomic binning, and we got different metagenomic bins, uh, bins. Uh, fortunately, we got we obtained the bins associated with the putative SB oxidizing bacteria, identifying the SB experiments, that they are azoacres, bin 9, azospiria, bin 10, and chelativorans. And we found all of the three beans harbor the genes in, involved in SB oxidation. That is the AIOA genes. You can see that Azoacus, Azospira, and Chelativora all contain the AIOA genes. Also, they contain the essential gene for denitrification and the carbon fixation. So these genes are the essential genes for anaerobic or nitrate dependent antimonide oxi oxidation. Finally, we, got, we get to our conclusion. So the SB contamination or antimony contamination substantially influenced the innate microbial community. The microorganisms, microorganisms may use nitrate to oxidize SB3 antimonide. 
So bacteria associated with azoacres, azospira, and chilatiborans may be responsible for nitrate-dependent antimonide oxidation. So these bacteria contain all necessary genes for nitrate-dependent sp3 oxidation. So finally, I would like to introduce. I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, Dr. Xiao and Max, and Dr. Fang Bai from our institute. I would also thank. I would like to thank my uh, postdoc who is working on this project, uh, Miao Miao Zhang, Rei Xu, and uh, Xiao Xu. So that's that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you guys for your patience and time. Hi, Max. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wei Min. Really interesting and i know there's going to be a lot of discussion on this i already have have a bunch of questions for you as well okay. but we will get back to that later and continue now with uh dimitrios Carposas from the department of biochemistry and biotechnology at the university of Thessaly in greece and examining fungicide applications and how the soil and philosphere microbial community respond to this so Dimitrios, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Max. I uh, hope you see my uh, my screen now. Is that everything uh, yes. okay? All good. Oh, great, okay. So um, I would like first to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to uh, present in this uh, webinar. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the response of uh, the soil and phylosphere microbial communities to repeated application of a fungicide. And uh, I'm going to talk about a specific fungicide. So basically, um, uh, we know that uh, pesticides are applied either as a soil drench or most of them are applied uh, on the upper uh, uh, plant parts, upper ground plant parts. So um, both uh, plant compartments, the phylosphere, and the rhizosphere are um, expected to be uh, exposed uh, to uh, pesticides. And um, that means that the microbes that they actually um, colonize, these two plant associated compartments are uh, exposed uh, to pesticides and they interact uh, with uh, pesticides on uh, their um, everyday life, actually. So um, basically, uh, upon the, the, the this uh, um, encounter pesticides encounter microbes and microbes encounter pesticides um, that we expected to to have an interaction between these two partners. So this uh, the outcome of this interaction can be either uh, toxicity uh, when uh, microbes uh, are exposed to pesticide levels that they cannot transform or use as an en energy source, or the, it can be um, biodegradation. Um, when uh, microbes are using pesticide as an energy source. So we can have both a uh, yin side of this interaction and a yang side of this interaction. Uh, but um, if we look in the literature, um, the overwhelming majority of uh, studies looking at these interactions, they have uh, focused on uh, soil. So we've, uh, for example, we've seen uh, both type of uh, outcomes of this interaction in soil. And I put some examples here where you can have a growth linked enhanced biodegradation of a pesticide like oxamil, uh, which is actually coupled with a gradual increase in the abundance of uh, bacteria that they carry uh, relevant catabolic genes like uh, CEHA. Or you can see um, a response, the opposite response, you can see a reduction in the rate of uh, nitrification, as you see here at the high concentrations rate, concentration rates of certain chemicals like a uh, prodion, for example, when it is applied at times 10 or times 100, it's concentration, uh, recommended concentration. But um, this is all about soil. Um, how about phylosphere? So, um, we know basically very little about the outcome of this interaction in the phylosphere. So we actually um, tested the hypothesis uh, that uh, phylosphere and rhizosphere exhibit uh, similar responses to the repeated exposure to pesticides. And this, uh, as I mentioned be, uh, before, this is the outcome of this interaction could span from accelerated biodegradation when you see microbes uh, rapidly adapting to this uh, pesticide substrate and grow and proliferate and degrade it rapidly, or you can see toxicity effects. And um, 
to test this hypothesis, uh, we had to select two main, main components of the of our experimental uh, plan. First was to select a, a, a pesticide, and this was our choice was Iprodion. It's an old-fashioned fungicide that is used in several crops. Um, the um, the criterion that we preferred Iprodion was the fact that it's relatively biodegradable, but it's also uh, it is also applied uh, as a foliage uh, fungicide, but also as a soil drench. And the second component was to select a um, plant that we'll in, uh, include in our study. And we selected pepper as a plant because uh, Iprodion is registered for using pepper crops and is registered for use as a either as a foliage applied chemical, but also through, drip, through the drip irrigation system. So, um, with uh, these uh, main uh, decisions, the main decisions of our experimentation already made, we set up a pot experiment uh, with uh, 62 pepper plants. Um, we transplanted uh, uh, all these uh, pepper plants to at the three to four leaf stage uh, in uh, our pots, and we left them to uh, to reach flowering. Flowering is the stage uh, of pepper plants where uh, iprodion applications actually commence in practice. So um, when plants uh, reached uh, flowering, we started applying uh, iprodion. So in uh, 30 of these pots, uh, plants were just treated on the leaves. Uh, 22 of these pots uh, received a soil drench application of iprodion, and we had 20 uh, pots that uh, received, they received no um, iprodion. Instead, they received water either on the leaves or on the soil. And this uh, application seem was uh, repeated uh, four times at uh, 30 day intervals. And um, just a quick look in the application and sampling plan. So you can see we indicate uh, with uh, red arrows the uh, iprodion application time points with uh, the thin uh, green arrows uh, time points where we extracted uh, DNA from leaves and soil. Uh, and with uh, the blue uh, thin arrows, you can uh, see the time points where we took samples for HP analysis to uh, determine iprodion transformation. At the end of these um, four applications, uh, four application seams or seam of iprodion, we took um, uh, samples from the rhizosphere and the phylosphere in order to uh, try to isolate iprodion degrading bacteria. So what did we measure? We actually measured the pesticide transformation on, on the leaves and the, uh, in the rhizosphere soil. We uh, applied amplicon sequencing analysis for uh, prokaryotes and fungi uh, in order to see how microbial community in the two uh, plant associated compartments respond to iprodion application uh, along this uh, experiment. And at the end of the, this application scene, we tried to isolate uh, bacteria that could degrade iprodion both from phylosphere and uh, rhizosphere uh, via enrichment cultures. So let's um, move to uh, the results. So first question was to see if what we actually uh, um, microbes are is how microbes are responding to um, to iprodion continuous exposure. Do they degrade it rapidly, or uh, are they uh, struggling with this repeated exposure scene? So it seems that uh, both uh, microbial communities, uh, both in phylosphere and rhizosphere. Uh, they seem to um, adapt uh, to rapid degradation of iprodion. Uh, in the upper panel, you can see the results for the soil, where you can see right from the first application, iprodion uh, degrades quite rapidly, which was not surprising uh, if you look at uh, the, the literature. Iprodion is relatively biodegradable. So, uh, but still, even if we started a very rapid uh, with a very rapid degradation of iprodion, still it it became with repeated application even more rapid. At the fourth application, we had a DT50 of uh, 0.4 days. When uh, we move uh, to phylosphere, you can see that uh, this uh, enhancement of uh, the bio of the degradation of iprodion was uh, much more prominent. Uh, and this is because we had a very slow degradation at the first application, and gradually after the second, third, and fourth uh, application, we started getting a faster degradation with DT50 uh, at the fourth application of 5.9 days. 
So in fact, we had an enhancement of the degradation of Iprodion in both studied uh, compartments. Uh, and then we tried to see how uh, this is mirrored in the in the composition of the microbial communities in the two uh, plant-associated compartments, uh, and we applied um, some uh, multivariate uh, analysis to determine uh, if the application of iprodion actually um, changed uh, uh, significantly the microbial communities. And you can see here that uh, I will. Okay, you can see here in the rhizosphere of bacteria and phyllosphere of bacteria, we had some uh, uh, significant uh, changes and the prodion application significantly um, structured the microbial community in both uh, plant associated compartments. Uh, Archaea for Archaea, that was uh, also the, the case uh, in the rhizosphere, but not in the phyllosphere where Archaea, they didn't seem to respond to um, uh, Iprodion application. So when we move to fungal community in the two compartments, you can see that uh, we had also um, a significant effect in the composition of the uh, fungal community, in both in the rhizosphere and the phylosphere, um, which was not really unexpected considering that uh, Iprodion is really uh, a fungicide. I'm not going to um, go into uh, details and tie you up of, with uh, uh, giving names of uh, a list of genera that they were uh, uh, increase or decrease in abundance. Um, but um, when we look um, uh, in the functions that some of these bacteria are, or fungi are involved, uh, the ones that show differential abundance in response to prodion, we could see that uh, the application of iprodion both in the phylosphere and in the rhizosphere of pepper plants seem to affect uh, the relative abundance of putative uh, plant pathogens, of putative human pathogens, of mycoparasites, and uh, of uh, uh, bacteria and fungi that they are known to be involved in uh, organic carbon uh, decomposition. But one of uh, one uh, uh, important and rather um, interesting ob observation that uh, got our attention was the fact that um, the abundance of OTUs belonging to Candidatus nitrososphaera, which, uh, the which is considered a dominant ammonia oxidizing uh, archaea lineage in uh, most agricultural soils, seemed to be um, negatively affected by uh, iprodion application in the rhizosphere. And this uh, is really uh, um, in agreement with our previous um, um, measurements that we've done in a different uh, experimental settings with Iprodion, uh, where we also noticed that uh, Candidatus nitrososphaera were really uh, negatively affected uh, by the application of Iprodion. So um, the next uh, step was to try to isolate the prodion degrading uh, bacteria, and we set up some enrichment cultures, both from the phylosphere and the rhizosphere. And you could see that uh, in the enrichment culture, we see some really fast degradation in both compartments. Uh, and we isolated uh, eventually three uh, degrading cultures that they were pure. Uh, and two of them were coming from the rhizosphere, and one was epiphytic. And uh, when we actually sequence their 16S uh, RNA gene to uh, identify, uh, to put them in, uh, in the phylogenetic, phylogenetic context, you see that uh, they were uh, very similar regarding the 16S RNA gene, but not, but not identical. And they, um, they seem to uh, actually uh, be sister and affiliate uh, with other pinearthrobacter strains that they are involved in the degradation of organic pollutants. But very much, it was very interesting to see that uh, it, they are very, very uh, close affiliate, closely affiliated with uh, other arthrobacter or pinearthrobacter strains that they are uh, involved in the degradation of iprodion. In fact, uh, the vast majority of uh, iprodion degraders that we know so far, they belong to this uh, genus, Pinearthrobacter, which is really interesting because they have been isolated from Japan, from Greece, from uh, US, uh, all these Pinearthrobacter strains, but all degraded iprodion. 
So uh, we tried to look a bit further and see uh, the transformation uh, pathway of the prodiol by these two, um, by uh, one soil derived and one phylosphere derived strain. And we noted that uh, they both shared the same metabolic pathway. The prodiol was degraded uh, through, two, through the production of two intermediate metabolites that they were eventually transformed into 3,5-dichloroaniline. And this is a pathway that is actually uh, also observed in uh, most previous soil, uh, de uh, soil de iprodion degrading bacteria. So uh, it seems that we isolated um, iprodion degraders from uh, two plant associated compartments that they are uh, phylogenetically very close to themselves and to previous Iprodion degraders that all belong to uh, the genus Pinearthrobacter, and they all share the same metabolic pathway. So uh, um, I would say that uh, we hypothesize that maybe there is a particular phenotypic uh, feature of Pinearthrobacters that facilitate their specialization for degrading uh, Iprodion. So to sum it up, um, it seems that the prodion repeated application induced uh, responses, similar responses uh, to the phylosphere and the uh, rhizospheric microbial communities. We observed on the one hand enhanced biodegradation of the prodion, which uh, came with a mobilization of pinearthrobacter bacteria uh, in uh, both exposed uh, plant associated compartments. And uh, at the same time, we both we uh, observed changes in the composition of the microbial communities in both studied compartments, which uh, really uh, affecting uh, uh, appear as affecting microbes that they are essential for the the plant uh, plant soil system homeostasis. So what's next? Uh, what we would like to um, look a bit uh, more on the mechanisms. Uh, that um, lead to enhanced biodegradation of the prodion in, in the phylosphere and see how this is uh, actually uh, evolved. Is it coming from uh, soil bacteria that they are mobilized from the plant phylosphere or they are true phylosphere uh, inhabitants that they are actually adapted to uh, a prodion degradation? And also to explore the arsenal of catabolic genes and uh, look at more on the revolution and organization in the protein and de de degrading bacteria from the phylosphere and the rhizosphere uh, using comparative genomics. Um, there was a recent uh, publication uh, on this area which uh, compared uh, the genomes of two um, pinearthrobacter strains uh, that they also isolated from Japan and they were uh, they both degraded uh, iprodion but uh, it seems that uh, the prodion transformation pathway, it's uh, not mature actually genetically. So we would like to enrich a bit more on this. And uh, we have now six uh, uh, pinearthrobacter degrading strains and we, will, um, we think that we will, uh, with comparative genomics, um, add a bit more information on this. So um, to conclude, I would like uh, to thank the people that contributed and these, uh, these appear with blue dots in this uh, photograph of the lab. And really this, uh, this work was, um, was uh, supported by um, uh, money coming from uh, two uh, EU funded projects. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for questions. Thank you. Very, very interesting degradation studies, and we'll come back to, to questions later. And then it's my pleasure to, well, thank you, and then introduce our final speaker for today, Karen Voigts from the Department of Bioscience Engineering at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. <clears throat> and we'll hear about green infrastructure and atmospheric pollution and how this shapes the microbiota. So, Karen, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me and see my uh, screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our work on uh, philosphere bacterial communities in, uh, in urban settings. Um, I would like to say that um, this work is, uh, is a result of uh, 
yeah, a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, the, yeah, both microbiologists and ecologists. So I think this is very important. And I first would like to thank my colleague Wenke. Um, she equally contributed to this work and she played an essential role as the microbiologist in this study. So it leaves me, the ecologist, to uh, present the, the work we did. So let me present you with the, the, the study we did uh, on phylosphere bacterial communities in uh, urban settings. And we looked at the influence green infrastructure in the city has and atmospheric pollution uh, has on the diversity and the composition of these phylosphere bacterial, bacterial communities. So as Dimitrios uh, already explained, the phylosphere, uh, it's, it's the um, it's the above, all the above ground surfaces of a, of a plant um, on the interface between the plant and the atmosphere. Um, and the dominant part is represented by the leaves. Um, it provides a unique but rather harsh uh, habitat for um, microbial life. It's colonized by, by fungi, uh, archaea and bacteria. And these bacteria are um, uh, numerically dominant. You can find millions, um, 10 millions of um, bacteria per square centimeter of leaf surface. The composition of, um, of these uh, communities depends, uh, it varies from tree to tree, and it depends on the, on the host species. And we also see a lot of spatial and temporal variation uh, between these communities. Um, these philosphere bacterial communities, they influence the health and, and, and the fitness of the plant by pathogenic, uh, pathogenic and antipathogenic effects. And as such, they also influence plant community diversity and the, the biomass they produce. For example, we see a disproportionate loss of fitness in some dominant plant species, or it can happen that the rare species uh, produces more seeds uh, through a compensatory response to a pathogen, pathogen infection. And it's also proven that the influence, the ecosystem functioning and the ecosystem services provided. Uh, you can think of uh, carbon sequestration, nitrogen cycling, or um, also the mitigation of air pollution by plants. And last but not least, they also provide an important source of airborne bacteria which of course, um, they are sorts of uh, bacteria to which uh, humans can be exposed. Um, next to that, uh, we also look to uh, urbanization and urbanization can be defined as the expansion of uh, the urban environment. And we can see cities as um, heterogeneous, dy heterogeneous uh, dynamic landscapes with of course high population densities, but also changes in land use and land cover, biochemical, bio, biochemical cycles in climate and hydrology. And we also know they have huge demands of energy and water and enormous emissions of carbon. Um, and this urbanization, this, uh, this expansion of the ur urban environment has uh, uh, effects on global and, and local environmental um, settings in it decreases the local um, biodiversity and it also accelerates the phenotypic changes in, in plants and animals um, and the question we had was okay this urbanization it's 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 a global trend but how does it affect the phylosphere bacterial communities um, for this uh, we wanted did not want to work with an urbanization gradient that's how it's done uh, mostly but we we wanted to work with a, a landscape ecological approach. So we looked at uh, how inter-tree variation in, uh, in diversity and composition um, of bacterial communities in the philosphere of trees um, in these urban settings are related to specific urban disturbance factors. And these urban disturbance factors are listed as uh, mechanisms that cause these changes in local biodiversity and these phenotypic changes in plants and animals. We cannot investigate all of them, of course, but we took out um, some. And um, the first was the loss and fragmentation of native habitat. And the second was the influence of novel disturbances. Um, more specifically, we looked at the effect of um, air pollutants. So um, we went out in the field, and um, this is um, 
how we did the work. So we selected uh, 55 London plane trees in the city of Antwerp, which is uh, located in the north of Belgium, in, uh, in the center of Europe. And the trees were in a range of 11 kilometers apart. We selected London plain because um, as a host species of the philosphere bacterial communities, because it's a rather common tree throughout cities and also in the city uh, we, um, we investigated. It's also really easy to recognize, which is kind of convenient when you're working with microbiologists. Um, and it's canopy, uh, or it, at least some parts of the canopy are um, out of reach for people to touch. So it decreases the chances of uh, contamination. So uh, the city of Antwerp is the second largest city um, in, in Belgium. It uh, houses about half a million of uh, inhabitants on 200 square kilometers. Um, it's this typical European um, medieval cities, like in, in the center, we have this old city center with residential and in commercial areas. Uh, and that's surrounded by a heavily trafficked ring motorways, motorway. And the city suffers, every day suffers from uh, huge traffic congestions. Um, outside the ring road, we have these um, more yeah, residential areas with more green areas in between. And in the north, we have the, the port of Antwerp, um, which is the second largest in, in Europe. And in the south, we have uh, specific um, uh, precious metals refinery plants. And there we find elevated levels of lead, arsenic, and cadmium um, in the air. So um, scattered throughout the city, we selected those trees. And uh, these trees, the, or the site they grow in, um, we allotted to five urban categories, which were um, trees in urban green, uh, along busy roads and residential areas, um, in industry and harbor areas, and along the water edge. And from these trees, uh, we took uh, leaf samples and they were washed within a buffer solution. And here you can see my colleague Wenke at work, um, taking the leaf samples to the lab. There we uh, isolated DNA, DNA and we performed uh, sequencing on the V4 region of the CTNS ribosomal RNA. So let me take you through the main results of this study. So uh, first we looked at um, how these communities differed between the different urban categories we had in our study. So when we looked at the OTO richness, we saw that surprisingly the richness of these communities was twice as low in um, in the phylosphere sampled in these urban green sites um, in comparison with uh, trees along busy roads or in urban residential areas or in industry and harbor areas. Um, and then we also calculated the beta diversity of these phylos phylosphere bacterial communities. And then we see that uh, we find higher levels in these urban green sites, but this seemed to be caused by both a dispersion effect as a location effect. So we could not draw any conclusions from that. On the right, uh, you can see a, a biplot of the PCA we did on the composition of these um, phylosphere bacterial communities. And you can see with me that yeah, we could, were not really able to see any uh, clear clusters um, according to the urban categories we uh, we um, we analyzed, um, and then we took a look at the core community. So the core community consisted of 62 um, OTUs, and they were um, yeah they were dominated by those typical phylosphere bacteria, Sphingomonas, Hymenobacter, Pantoa, Yantinobacterium, and um, Pseudomonas fragi. Um, and we saw that in um, on trees in urban green sites, we saw that these um, core community was was really abundant, very uh, much more abundant than at the other sites, uh, especially these along uh, busy roads and in residential areas. Um, um, so that was was quite strange to see that this core community was really much more abundant in these urban green areas. So. For me, these, these analyses were not satisfying. So we wanted to do uh, some more digging and we wanted to look at these specific, um, yeah, these urban um, disturbance factors in, in particular. 
And the first one was uh, with air pollution. And for this, we did some biomagnetic analysis. Um, and this uh, analysis, we um, we do um, biomagnetic analysis of, of leaves. And in that way, we measured the saturation isothermal remnant magnetization, which is um, is the magnetization that remains after a sample is magnetized in a very strong field. Um, this uh, saturation isothermal remnant magnetization, uh, or short CERN, we call it, it's a proxy metric for air pollution. So um, it's shown to relate with uh, particulate matter and trace element uh, content in particles that are deposited on the leaf. And they're a good indicator of um, time integrated exposure to PM10, but it also relates uh, with nitrogen oxide concentrations in the atmosphere and with particle bound trace elements, which are uh, co-emitted or adsorbed to the to these particles. So it mainly relates to exposure to combustion, um, exhaust emissions by motorized traffic, but also to uh, emissions from industrial activity. So it is not a direct measure of, of atmospheric concentrations, but it's a time integrated uh, exposure proxy um, to uh, of PM10. And um, to our surprise, we cannot find a relationship between the richness in our communities of the phylosphere and, um, and air pollution. And then we looked at the composition. Um, and this, um, for this, we calculated the beta diversity again. Um, but this time we did a beta diversity partitioning. So um, we split up this beta diversity in a nestedness resultant dissimilarity and in a Simpson dissimilarity. Um, so the, the, the nestedness resultant uh, relates to shifts due to um, subsetting of, uh, of, of the communities. Um, and um, the Simpson dissimilarity relates to actually to the it's just a, an idea, gives an idea about um, replacement of species by other species uh, within a community. Um, so that's what we've done, and you can see this in the in the graph. So the the left in in the center of the slide, you can see the nestedness resultant beta diversity, and it's plotted against the the dissimilarity in um, air pollution proxy. And on the right, you can see the turnover beta diversity, which is plotted against the uh, similarity in, in air pollution exposure again. And we saw that there was no relation with the nestedness um, re resultant beta diversity, um, but we did see a significant positive relationship um, between this um, turnover beta diversity component with the difference in, um, in, in air pollution. Um, so, uh, and then we looked at the most abundant genera, and then we couldn't really see a lot of uh, obvious things uh, and a lot of changes. The only thing we saw was that the abundance or the relative abundance of Orestonia was increased uh, when the level of air pollution was increased. So, based on this, um, we made the conclusion that you can see shifts in, in community composition um, occurring in these um, bacterial communities in the form of taxa turnover um, as related to air pollution. So uh, in this case, we can see species disappear and that they are replaced by other species that appear. Um, so this suggests that exposure to, to air pollution relates with, with changes in the composition, but not in richness. Um, so it's really a, in a balanced equilibrium of taxa gain and taxa loss. And in the end, in net, there's no loss of, uh, of, of taxa to um, observed. So for this, we hypothesize that air pollution um, can affect the phallocer bacteria either directly as a, because air pollution can be a resource or it can uh, be a stressor. Um, but it can also be indirectly through um, effects through the plant uh, via changes in, in leaf characteristics, like we've seen um, effects of air pollution on stomatal density and leaf wettability and the specific leaf area, for example, in many of our previous studies. And then we had a look at uh, another um, urban uh, disturbance factor, and which is um, change in land use, land cover. And 
for this, we um, looked at uh, the Urban Atlas. The at Urban Atlas is um, it, it's a um, um, it's a layer of, of land cover and land use, which is uh, produced by um, in the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service of the European Union and the European Environment Agency, and it pro provides information on um, on land use and land cover at the 2.5 meter resolution. And from these maps, um, we calculated uh, several landscape metrics like land cover richness and diversity. But also land cover proportions of the different land cover land use types we can find in this map, among which uh, were urban fabric, uh, water roads, um, but also green infrastructure, which we defined as everything that's um, urban green, which is agricultural and semi-natural, um, or also including forests, if you ever can find them, of course, in, in, the, in these densely built up uh, cities. And then uh, from these uh, from these landscape metrics, uh, we saw that there was a relationship with uh, the alpha diversity in our communities. So we saw that when the uh, proportion of green infrastructure in a buffer area around a tree increased, then we saw that the OTU richness decreased. So the number of OTUs in our in our communities were reduced when we had less green in the surroundings of our tree, which was quite quite strange though and unexpected. Then when we look at the composition, again, we did the PETA diversity partitioning and here we didn't really see a, a relationship with the turnover component of beta diversity like we've seen for air pollution, but this time we saw a relationship with the nestedness result on beta diversity. So uh, with, with um, an increasing difference in the proportion of green infrastructure in a buffer zone around the trees, we saw that there was an increase in the nestedness resultant um, beta diversity. So um, the more uh, trees differed in the amount of green infrastructure around them, the more they, they moved uh, away from each other in composition of, uh, of, of the phallosphere bacteria on the, um, and this was related to, to nestedness. So um, next to that, we also looked at to the most abundant species and we saw some species like really increasing in abundance in these areas with a lot of green infrastructure, um, like Hemenobacter, Fingermonas and Byrinchia, like this really typical phylosphere uh, bacteria. While others, um, seven genera in total, they decreased like um, Acinetobacter, Scarmonella, um, those are generally decreased when there was more green infrastructure surrounding the tree. And then the core community, then we saw that it really increased in, in relative abundance when there was more green. So when we put all of this data together, when, then we can see that um, the bacterial communities on, on trees in areas with more green infrastructure, they really can be seen as a subset of the communities that, that occur in these um, in areas with less green. And so we see that the presence of more and also closer to green infrastructure to a tree reduces its uh, diversity. And that's really strange because that's opposite to what actually is observed for, um, for in urban areas for a lot of taxa, like thinking of um, insects and birds, where we see that uh, when there's less green infrastructure um, available, we see that the, that the diversity, the number of species the declines. Um, so this was uh, contrary to what we expected, actually. Um, and then when looking at the community composition, we see that um, that in these green, when there's a lot of green infrastructure, we see this reduction in, the, in, in, in diversity, but also it's like the core community gets stronger and stronger. So plenty of genera were introduced in the community uh, when there was uh, more of the other land use uh, or land cover uh, types available. And those were mainly anthropogenic um, land use and land covers. And the species with higher abundances in the phylosphere of the trees in the green areas could be seen as like the more autochthonous um, plain phylosphere specific core species. And they're more adapted to resisting these harsh environments. Um, but uh, next to that, there are taxa that were introduced and increased in these um, 
in these um, in, this, in these areas that were more um, anthropogenic with less green, um, and they may originate from typical urban sources like um, concrete or just people passing by, um, all the movements of the cars, like with all the the dust um, that is resuspended in the air. So uh, the bacteria coming from these non-green land cover types could be they enrich the urban phylosphere, but they could be considered as more the exotic species that come um, that come and, and, and enrich these uh, these phylosphere bacterial communities. It could be that this is related to lower dispersal in these areas with more green infrastructure, uh, but it could also be related to um, altered selection pressure, of course. So this uh, con the concluding slide is that in these uh, in these city areas we see that there's an effect of green infrastructure which leads to lower diversity, um, but the presence of more core OTUs that more or those typical phylosphere species, um, while uh, the effect of air pollution is uh, more related to turnover. So some species disappear, other pe uh, species appear, and in the end we have the same diversity. So that's the, the story we, we had in this in this paper. Um, if you want to read more about it, then uh, I would say go and read our paper. Um, but uh, any questions are um, are welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen. And previously, thank you again, Dimitrios and Wayman and Stefan. I think we have time for discussion and uh, any questions that are coming from the audience. So. Again, please uh, send in your questions through the uh, Q&A function in, in a GoToWebinar, and we will then respond to them. But let's while I go through what we have coming in, maybe, Stefan, you want to, to start? I know you had some, some aspects that you wanted to get into. So, so uh, maybe we start with uh, somebody who's really late in the day. I don't know how, how late it is, Waymin, at your end, but maybe I can start with well, I you. I think it's already tomorrow, Waymin, so thank you for staying up. Uh, okay, so a question for tomorrow then. Uh, um, yes, so, so it was really interesting. I mean, you showed lots of stuff that was also not in the paper, but I guess one common thread between what you showed and what's in the paper is about the um, when you get really these uh, these um, different patterns of metabolism uh, in particular those related to to antimony and um, i was wondering if um, you could see a clear pattern in in your studies with uh, redox potential uh, in different areas of soil, you will have different redox potentials. So, did you see things coming up uh, okay. in relation to redox potential and maybe soil depth? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, actually, the reviewer also asked the same questions. So, what is the redox potentials of the, the death resolved soil profiles? Unfortunately, we, uh, when we doing the sampling, we don't have the instrument to to measure the a redox potential. I think it's kind of difficult to measure the redox potential in, in situ. So, uh, so my answer is we we don't. I, I think we don't measure the pH or any other uh, parameters related to the uh, redox potential. Yeah, but this is a good yes. question, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, but maybe uh, from the names of the uh, OTUs that you got, you can infer maybe something yeah. which is more anaerobic or more oxic. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think maybe the more anaerobic is well, you know, enriched in the bottom soil, and the surface soil is kind of aerobic. So I think this, but I, I didn't get a chance to look back to my papers. So we pub published this paper last year. So I, I may go back to see what happened in the in the in the soil profiles. So this is one aspect. I mean, you focused, of course, on the antimony. Mm -hmm. uh, either reduction oxidation. And that's, of course, for the microbes with this metabolic capability, a potential energy resource. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you would expect that they would become enriched. What about other key ecosystem processes? 
I mean, what, what, I mean, so you have contamination through antimony. How is that affecting nitrogen, sulfur, carbon cycling, and what are so called the broader ecological uh, consequences? Okay. Yeah, actually, this is a good question. So, uh, so in this case, we mainly focus on the antimony cycling because we focus on the, the microorganisms, microorganisms participating in this element, this antimony cycling. However, when we go back to uh, tailings, the tailings is oligotrophic uh, environments. So in that case, we found a very specific biogeochemical process relating to the antimony cycling. So we found the sulfur oxidized antimony uh, reduction. So in that case, the microorganisms, the microorganisms didn't use the uh, organic matters as the carbon source. They used the inorganic carbons. I think this is the a case for the capability of the microorganisms thriving in some oligotrophic environments. So in this in in the oligotrophic environment, they develop or they involve some very specific uh, uh, metabolic trains or metabolic potentials. I think this is a case showing how the microorganisms linking the carbon, the sulfur, and metal cyclings. So I have a question for Dimitrios. The, the, the strains you isolated uh, that degrade, um, I, so I, I think you said or wrote that they are actually not visible in your in your diversity profiles right so, so they, they are very low abundance uh, did you try to check what what is the actual abundance using another technique uh, than than, than uh, OT, you know sequencing did you try to do qpcr or something do you have an idea how rare these these organisms are yeah um Yes, indeed. Uh, we, when we looked back in the pinearthrobacters that we've isolated, and we looked back in our data set to see uh, if these were actually um, somehow enriched during this application process, we found some OTUs, uh, some pinearthrobacter uh, OTUs, that they were not actually the ones that uh, we isolated. Uh, so it seems that they were uh, very low at very low abundance. These um, pinearthrobacters that we isolated. But uh, yes, we didn't actually go back uh, to uh, follow up their uh, abundance uh, during uh, this uh, enrichment process. And uh, this is um, always, a, a, I would say, a, a problem that might arise when you use uh, enrichment cultures for isolation. Um, somehow you might, um, you know, you might select something that was not a main player in, in, in situ, in the phylosphere or in soil, or it was a very slow degrade, a very slow grower, which, is, which actually a pinearthrobacters are very slow growers and very uh, lazy uh, microbes in soil at least. And uh, if you give them in enrichment culture the right, uh, the right um, uh, favorable conditions, you might uh, see them uh, uh, to, to grow fast and you isolate them. Or, of course, during the enrichment culture, you might isolate uh, something that actually picked up the function during the enrichment culture, okay? But it's strange uh, that uh, pinearthrobacters seem to appear always, regardless of the environmental compartment you are looking, uh, they appear always as uh, eprodion degraders which is, um, I'm not a great fan of the, of the specificity of bacteria when you consider that uh, most of these catabolic pathways, they are uh, uh, driven by uh, plasmids and by mobile genetic elements. Uh, but uh, here it seems to be uh, somehow uh, some sort of specificity in this um, um, capacity, this phenotype. A specific uh, relation between pinearthrobacters and in, in prodion transformation, and we would like to actually uh, look at this a bit further with uh, genomic analysis to see what actually triggers this uh, specialization. But uh, we didn't actually trace back with qPCR uh, of these pinearthrobacter strains that we isolated. 
so you're seeing fairly rapid degradation on their end. So this is one question here from the uh, audience. So if it, the fungicide is degraded so quickly, is it still effective? <laughs> well, that's a good question because uh, when we talk about enhanced biodegradation, uh, we actually, uh, mo uh, in a lot of cases, you lose efficiency. So that's another question that uh, it was raised by uh, by our paper, by our, our, the work that this uh, enhanced biodegradation that we look with repeated application. So enhanced biodegradation was always the case, and we knew about it in soil. Iprodion was one of these uh, pesticides that in soil uh, suffers from enhanced biodegradation and it loses its efficiency. Uh, but um, in phylosphere, it's the first uh, report of an, this uh, phenomenon of enhanced biodegradation. And if you consider that the prudion is also a foliage applied fungicide, uh, you often, uh, I mean, uh, you, you could expect that it has a reduced efficiency. And this aspect has been neglected a lot in uh, for insect, insect control and fung, fung, fungi control that most of the times we link it to uh, resistant mechanisms, but uh, biodegradation could be also a, a, a mechanism that le leads to uh, uh, reduced efficiency. Yeah. So here's one question, thank you for uh, Karen and uh, the, where do I find it? Oh, in terms of the radius, I mean, so you looked at the green space around uh, so what radius around a plant would you consider important as a bacterial source to take into account? And I was wondering, a follow-up to that question, what about particulate matter? What's the microbial community on the pollution, the particulates that are landing on the leaf? And could this be a source of why there is a high diversity? So this question of what area around a plant, but also what would be other sources? Yeah, so uh, we uh, we tested different uh, distances for these buffers. So we started with buffer zones of uh, of uh, 20 meters, and we went back went all the way to one kilometers. If you go further than that, then you cover almost half of the of the city. So that's no no point there. Um, but then we look and then we saw for the, all the analysis we did, we came actually to the same conclusion that at distance of 100 200 meters. We had the best fits, or, or sometimes it was the only fit, uh, good fit we we got. So it seems that a distance of 100, 200 meters is a is a range in which this green infrastructure has a has a significant effect. So I, I think there's also been a, a study that uh, looked in, into these um, the composition of airborne um, of these airborne bacteria in the in the atmosphere. And they also found, in, even within a city, uh, differences in composition, big differences in composition um, at different locations in the city. So it really has a high variation in these uh, in the sources of of, um, of bacteria, which can land in the in the phyllosphere, of course. Yeah. So based on our data, it seems that 100, uh, 200 meters is a, a good range. And then regarding this, um, the the bacteria on PM. That's um, I don't know much about that, but um, if you look at the formation of your primary PM, um, so primary PM coming straight from from the source, and and next to that you have the secondary PM, which is formed in the atmosphere. Um, so this the primary PM, if it's uh, it comes from the exhaust pipe from from vehicles, it's it's quite it's it's very hot, so it, I don't think that a lot of bacteria will reside on the, the surface of these particles. Um, but of course, the PM that comes from resuspension of of dust, yeah, that can be loaded with with soil part with soil bacteria, of course, yeah. And then the the secondary uh, PM, which is formed in the atmosphere, they uh, they are loaded, yeah, with air, these airborne bacteria. Um, and of course, there's um, an interplay between the bacteria that are in the atmosphere and which are on the leaves, um, because the leaves are a continuous source also of bacteria in the in the surroundings. But then the bacteria that are on the leaves also depend on what's coming in through dispersal from uh, from the atmosphere. 
so it's difficult to say here what's the source, what's the what's the sink. Uh, they're in, in continuous interaction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's one sort of overreaching question for everyone. This is from Tilman Luders um, on the aspect of ecotoxicology with higher organisms that it's always coming up with essentially predicted no effect concentrations or LD50s or, or something like that. Is there going to be a corresponding microbial indicator, whether that's in uh, mining sites or the urban environment or agricultural systems with uh, use of, of pesticides? So is there something that will be some microbial indicator that we can use uh, broadly to understand what are the consequences? Uh, to actually, a, a, anyone, please jump in. I, I can start if you want. Um, well, I could, uh, I could certainly um, uh, answer that for the agricultural environment. So from um, the point of view of, of microbial functioning, I would say from my experience and from what uh, comes up in the literature in the last uh, five or six years, um, we've uh, actually come, come uh, to a conclusion, I would say, that, that there are two main uh, microbial groups that uh, they are uh, more responsive to pesticides or um, organic pollutants, I would say, or perturbations in soil environment. And uh, these are uh, the uh, ammonia oxidizing microbes, I would say first, and then it's arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which uh, always uh, with the symbionts, obligator symbionts that are like a arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, is um, sometimes difficult to tell, um, to separate uh, toxicity to plant, which is the host, uh, or the uh, uh, microbe itself. But uh, ammonia oxidizers are uh, really good indicators because they are seem to be ecotoxicologically responsive to uh, pesticides. We have good tools to measure the diversity, to measure their function. Um, and uh, they are very important uh, organisms for um, end cycling in, uh, in soil. So I would say that I would actually put forward uh, first uh, ammonia oxidizers and then arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi as two potential indicators of uh, toxicity um, induced by pesticide app application. Okay, thank you. Wayman, uh, the metal contaminated sites, what do you think is going to be some kind of a measure to understand how problematic or polluted a site is to sort of have a dipstick to say, yep. Yeah, this is what we need to do. So actually, I, uh, I don't think which bacteria can be the bioindicators, but in our cases, we found many bacteria are very capable to transform the, the metal. So I think maybe they can be uh, indicators for the, for the potential for future bioremediation. For example, the geobacters. We found the geobacter are responsible for anti-monate reduction in many in many rice paddies. We performed the DNA seq, and we found we, we took the soil samples from across the southwest China from uh, five different five different uh, 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 five different regions, and all of them. So we performed DNA seq, and we found all of uh, geobacter was identifying as the anti re reducers in all this uh, site. In, a, in another case, we found thiobacillus. The thiobacillus are very capable in the tailings. So this guy can do a lot of job. For example, they can oxidize the arsenite. They can also reduce the arsenate. They can oxidize the antimonite and they can reduce some and others, uh, other uh, metals in the, in the tailings. So, I, I don't think there might be a universal bioindicators in the mining area, but if we can focus on the soil types, for example, the, the rice paddies or the agriculture soil or the tailings, maybe we can we can uh, point out, we can pinpoint some very super bad, maybe super bad or maybe very capable bacteria. So that's my answer. Okay. And Karen, what do you think about the, the urban environment? Yeah difficult question but it's a good one um it's difficult um we see so many so many 
um, taxa there, but it's one thing is clear for like, um, but maybe that's not that interesting, <laughs> but an indicator for more, the more available green in the surroundings. And we could say it's clearly Hymenobacter and Sphingomonas. It's, it's clear from several of our studies that those are uh, the, the, the most thriving in these more greener areas. Regarding air pollution, it's still a question we're working on, but we see, for example, uh, we see uh, Skermanella and Rastonia popping up as, um, as species that are that seem to be able to cope with these high levels of relatively high levels of air pollution. Um, but to pinpoint it to, to specific taxa, it's I think it's a little too early to, to do that because a number of studies working on this on the effect of, of air pollution on these sphere bacterial communities are it's um, it's still limited. But uh, we're working on it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Stefan, uh, any additional question yeah, here or add to that? I'm not an expert on these studies, of course, but reading through these papers, I think for Tilman or Eludos also, I guess there may be an, an extra twist to this to this uh, minimal concentration because from uh, Dimitrios' and uh, Karen's paper, I, I became aware of the fact that a substance which is toxic to a range of organisms can actually, uh, by mitigating their development, give rise to other uh, bacteria which are then pathogens. So it would be an indirect effect, which maybe could also be measured, which is interesting. Like you had uh, in Dimitrios' case, you had the uh, uh, pesticide and then the fungal uh, pathogens disappear, but the human pathogens may come up. And I guess Karen has seen similar things happening in the urban system, or at least uh, it was alluded to in the paper. So indirect effects with pathogen, human pathogens coming up, that could be also an interesting measure of, uh, you know, minimal concentrations of toxics that should not be increased. Yeah, yeah. These indirect uh, effects, uh, I think, they can be very important because we're al always thinking in uh, in a way of direct effects. But uh, the interaction with the plant is is very important in in our, in our study with in the phylosphere, um, and it is very plausible that the effects we see on the phylosphere are are indirect, and in that way have an influence on the composition of the phylosphere. Like for example, we've seen. Um, the effects of air pollution on only, like only morphology only, we can see that there's an effect on stomatal density, which of course has an effect on uh, where, where bacteria can reside on the leaf. Um, the specific leaf air, the DCA, so the, the leaf wettability, of uh, it's also uh, influenced by air pollution. And it's known that uh, it relates to the, with, uh, with the bacteria that uh, occur on the leaf. So. Yeah, the indirect effects are very worthwhile um, yeah, looking into. And I think the other aspect to remember is that even though the community might drastically change, the functions might still be there because of all of the redundancy. So going back to how is that affecting core ecosystem services, even if the players are completely different. So no, it's a different, difficult question. Uh, so let's see, I think we're going to have to wrap up. I mean, we're now into an hour and a half. So, Stefan, any final questions or comments? Or no, I think uh, this was really, uh, as, as we expected, uh, a real diverse uh, overview of uh, different aspects of microbial ecotoxicology as an expression, as a term for those who were wondering what it meant, I guess. We know a little bit more now. Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. So thank you. There are still a few questions left that we didn't have time for. So we will distribute these by email and uh, you may then get a response just for the, you in the audience to know that there are still things that we'll try to get back to you with specific uh, answers. So again, no, thank you. Karen, Wayman, Dimitrios, Stefan, and everybody in the audience. This has been a really interesting session and hope to see you again in about a month 
when we have a, a webinar on microbes and metals. So that will continue on the theme that Wayman had. And there's another FEMS webinar next week on vaccines, which of course is on everybody's mind right now. And while we, one reason why we are, are doing these uh, webinars as well. So thank you again, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all in person uh, soon again. Thank you. Bye.